أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. So we've been speaking about the Battle of Uhud. We mentioned that the Battle of Uhud commences with Talha ibn Abi Talha, the standard bearer, challenging the Muslims uh, to -to face-to-face combat. And he was essentially ridiculing them, saying that if you believe that our swords will send you to paradise, then come forward. And we mentioned that Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, responds to that challenge. Ali ibn Abi Talib kills Talha ibn Abi Talha, who is uh, from the, the tribe. Uh, he's from a, a very famous tribe, which is known for always you know, holding the, the standards in the battles. And the family of, uh, of Talha, his brothers, each of them, they, they grab the, the standard after it falls, and one after the other, they are killed. And some reports mention that Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, kills about nine of them. Now after this happens, the, uh, after Ali ibn Abi Talib decimates uh, the family of uh, of Abd al-Dar, the two armies clash, they meet. Now historians mention that Abu Dujana al-Ansari begins wreaking havoc on the battlefield. If you recall, this is the famous companion of the Prophet who is given the sword of Rasulullah right before the battle. The, the Prophet offers his sword to his companions and he asks them, you know, who among you will uh, observe and uphold the right of the sword? A few of them uh, express their interest in holding it, but the Prophet ﷺ, he motions to Abu Dujana and he gives it to him. And we mentioned that after receiving the sword of the Prophet, he begins, you know, walking with, uh, with pride and with some, uh, you know, s- swinging his sword around. And this is when the Prophet says that this is a type of walk that is disliked by Allah except in a situation like this. So when the two armies clash, Abu Dujana, he displays uh, his courage and his bravery and he actually strikes down every man that comes in his path. You know, he was literally like a wrecking ball on the day of Uhud and he stops just short of killing Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, when he realizes that, you know, it's a woman. You know, he was killing one man after the other, literally decimating anyone who who stands before him, and he ends up almost killing Hind. Now, amid the clamor and the commotion, a, a slave by the name of Wahshi, he gets a clear shot at Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet, and he fatally pierces his chest uh, with his javelin. Now, Wahshi was a slave that belonged to a man by the name of Jubair ibn Mut'am. And he was known for his accuracy in throwing spears. And Hind, after the battle of Badr, after losing her father and her uncle and her brother in bed, she had, she wanted to avenge the deaths of her father, uncle, and brother. And therefore she summons Wahshi because her ma- the master of Wahshi, Jubair was a close friend of Abu Sufyan's family. She says to him that I want to avenge those who killed my family. And she says to Wahshi that I have three targets. There are three men 
whose blood I want to be shed. I want you to either kill Muhammad, Ali, or Hamza. Now Wahshi, of course, who is very experienced in the, the, uh, in the art of war, he knows his craft, he says to Hind that as for Muhammad, it's going to be very difficult to kill Muhammad because he's protected. He's always surrounded by his companions. So Muhammad is a difficult target. And then he says, as for Ali, Ali is always on guard. He's also a very difficult target. Ali is always looking behind him. He's aware. He's hyper aware of his surroundings. As for Hamza, I might be able to get Hamza for you. So this is what he says to her uh, before the battle of Uhud. And indeed, he seizes the opportunity and he ends up killing Hamza. If you recall, brothers and sisters, we mentioned that there was another uh, companion of the Prophet who joined uh, after the army of the Prophet had set out for Uhud, and that is Hamdala ibn Abi Amr. And this is that young man who was the, the son of Abu Amr, who was the, uh, the, uh, the Christian monk, who was a, a sworn enemy of the Prophet, who was called by the people of uh, Yathrib, uh, Abu Amr al-Fasiq, as opposed to Am Abu Amr al-Rahib. So this Hamdala was the son of that man, and he marries the daughter of Abdullah ibn Ubay, who was the head of the Munafiqeen. And they ended up get, getting married. Their wedding was held on the eve of Uhud, and she sees a dream that her newlywed husband, uh, that he's among the inhabitants of paradise. In any case, we mentioned the story already. Hanbala uh, joins the battle uh, in a state of Janaba, and he's martyred at the foot of Mount Uhud. And we mentioned that Jamila, his wife, came to the Prophet because she knew that you know after Fajr, he did not have the opportunity to perform ghusl because they were intimate with each other after, uh, shortly after Salatul Fajr. So the Prophet says that, you know, don't worry about that because the malaika, the angels, are washing, they are performing the ritual bath on him. And this is why he's known as Ghasilul Malaika. Now after a period of intense fighting between the Prophet's forces and the Quraysh, the Muslims, they finally break the enemy line. After witnessing what Ali ibn Abi Talib did to the standard bearers, and after seeing the heroics of Abu Dujana and others, the, the morale of the Quraysh was destroyed. And they were so terrified by the strength and the resilience of the Muslims that they started to flee the battlefield. Al-Bara' ibn Azib, one of the companions of the Prophet, he, who was an eyewitness, he says about the retreat of the mushrikeen on the day of Uhud, he says, when we fought them at Uhud, when we fought the pagans at Uhud, they turned and fled until I saw with my own eyes the legs of the women as they lifted their skirts running up the mountains, and I could see their ankle bracelets. So the men and the women, they escaped, they fled. And Ibn Hisham adds that, uh, I remember clearly seeing Hind and her female companions all running up the mountains. So there was, there was a moment in the battle where it was clear the Muslims felt that that's it, the Quraysh has been defeated. The women, the men, they're all fleeing up the mountain. Now, the archers who were stationed on the hill of Ainain, if you recall, the Prophet told them, do not leave your position under any circumstances. So 
they remained for some time. We don't know how long they remained on that hill, but it seems that they remained long enough to where the archers started to argue amongst themselves. When the mushrikeen retreated and they saw other Muslims gathering the ghanima, they were gathering the, the spoils of war, they were procuring uh, some of the, the most expensive weapons that were left at the battlefield because when the mushrikeen retreated, they were leaving behind uh, expensive weapons. They were leaving behind, in some cases, camels, tents, and other, other valuables. So these 50 archers, they're standing there, and they're seeing all of their Muslim counterparts, you know, amassing all of this wealth in front of their eyes. And to them, the war is over. We defeated the mushrikeen. So what happens is that they have this, this fear of missing out. They, they perhaps thought that, you know, maybe the Prophet forgot us. He forgot to tell us. Maybe he forgot that we were on the, the hill. So a few of the archers suggest that, listen, you know, the battle, the battle is over. So let's descend and let's gather some of the spoils. Why should we deprive ourselves? of the spoils. There was arguments. There was a dispute between the archers until eventually, and we don't know how, you know, maybe this argument continued for 20, 30 minutes, who knows. But about 38 archers abandoned their post to collect the spoils. And they leave Abdullah ibn Jubayr, who was in charge of them, with only about a dozen archers to protect the rear of the Muslim army. And this is where we see that Khalid ibn al-Walid and Ikrama, they, they spot an opening. And this shows you how skilled they were in battle. So even though the others ran away, they still stayed behind to, to see if there was a chance that they could turn the tide. They wanted to see if they could capitalize on the, uh, the negligence and the complacency of the Muslims. And indeed, that opportunity presented itself. So they spot that opening and they circle around to attack the Prophet's forces from behind. Khalid ibn al-Walid has about 200 men in his brigade and they're on horses. And... It seems that even those 12 archers, they came to the bottom. They remained on the hill, but they were on the bottom of the hill. And Khalid ibn al-Walid comes around and he slaughters the remaining 12 archers. Now what happens next is that because the Muslims thought that the battle was over, many of them had put their weapons down and they were literally carrying the spoils, they were carrying shields and you know other items that the mushrikeen had left. So now they're not able to defend themselves. So Khalid ibn al-Walid literally has a field day with the Muslims, striking one after the other. What's interesting is that when you look at the Quran, and by the way, there are many uh, verses in Surah Ali Imran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the battle of Uhud and some of the, uh, uh, he speaks also about the aftermath of Uhud. So if you want to uh, study what the Quran says about the battle of Uhud, Surah uh, Ali Imran definitely uh, provides uh, quite a bit of insight. If you look at verse 152 of Surah Ali Imran, Surah number three, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sharply criticizes, he condemns those Muslims who disobeyed the Prophet, especially those archers who ignored the command of the Prophet and came down from that hill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدًا إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِهِ 
Allah says, and Allah had surely, certainly fulfilled His promise to you when you were killing the enemy by His permission. The battle was won by the Muslims. If they, if they remained obedient to the Prophet, Uhud uh, would have been a decisive victory, even more decisive than Badr. In fact, up until the moment when the archers came down, it's possible that there, were not, there was not a single casualty uh, in the ranks of the Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I, I fulfilled my promise that you would be victorious. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I promised you victory. I fulfilled my promise until the time when you lost courage and fell to dispute about the order given by the Prophet. Because some of the archers were saying that he told us to remain here under any circumstance. Others said, no, the battle's over. He meant that stay here only during the battle. Maybe he forgot about us. Maybe he became busy and preoccupied. Let us leave our positions. So they were arguing amongst themselves. And disobeyed, Allah says, after he had shown you that which you love. Allah showed them a little bit of dunya to test them. And then Allah says, and this is, this is very important because Allah essentially divides the companions of the Prophet into two groups. He says to them on the day of Uhud, there were two types of companions. He says, مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ Allah says, among you, who is you? Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet. Allah says, among you are some who desire dunya. And among you are some who desire the Akhirah. And this is exactly what the Shi'i position is with regards to the status of the companions. We say that yes, some of them were pious and others were not. مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ We honor and we revere those who were seeking Akhirah. And we have our reservations about those companions who sought dunya. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, ثُمَّ صَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ لِيَبْتَلِيَكُمْ Allah then says, Then He turned you back from them, defeated, that He might test you. وَلَقَدْ عَفَى عَنْكُمْ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And Allah says that I have pardoned you for what you did in Uhud, and Allah is uh, the possessor of bounty for the believers. In verse 153 of Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the moment when the Muslims begin to flee and run up the mountain themselves. Allah says, إِذْ تُصْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْوُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ Allah says, remember you, remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside. Allah is saying that you ran without even looking behind you. وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ You ran away. You ran without even looking behind you while the messenger was calling you. Rasulullah was calling them to come back. And this in and of itself was a great act of courage by the Prophet. Because as we will, as we will mention, there was a moment in the battle when the mushrikeen thought that the Prophet was killed, and by shouting out to his companions, come back, he was alerting to them, he was alerting them that I'm still alive, and the Prophet was their main target. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside at anyone, while the messenger was calling you from behind. He was telling you to come back, to return, so there is confusion in the ranks of the Muslims. They scatter. You know, after Khalid ibn al-Walid penetrates through the, the, the ranks of the Muslims, there was so much confusion because Khalid ibn al-Walid is in the middle. 
And some Muslims could not even distinguish who was a Muslim and who was a mushrik because he, Khalid ibn al-Walid was right in the middle of the Muslims. He had Muslims on both sides. And this is why we have some reports that some Muslims accidentally killed other Muslims because there was so much chaos and pandemonium that it was difficult for them to uh, ascertain who they were actually fighting. Now, in the midst of this confusion, of course, majority retreated. They climbed the mountain. Others ran to Medina. There were some companions who literally went missing for three days. They were running and hiding. And they didn't show up for three days because they were completely terrified uh, in the battlefield. The Prophet ﷺ is left. So when the companions retreat, Rasulullah is left with only Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Dujana, and Sahal ibn Hunayf. Three people are left guarding the Prophet. Ali ibn Abi Talib is defending the Prophet with every atom of his being. And he's, he's pushing them back to the point that narrations mention that his sword breaks as he's fighting. So as he's pushing the enemies back and protecting the Prophet, Ali's sword breaks and he turns to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, how can I defend you? My sword broke. I need, I need, I need a weapon. And this is where the Prophet gives Amir al muminin according to some narrations, this is when he gives him Dhul Faqar. And as Ali is fighting off the mushrikeen, an angel, the narrations say, an angel cries out, seeing Ali giving all, using all of his energy and might to defend the Prophet. The angel calls out, لا سيف إلا ذو الفقار ولا فتى إلا علي. There is no sword other than ذو الفقار and there is no warrior like there is no warrior but Ali. Of course, this is hyperbole because there were other swords, but Ali's sword was so effective that it's as if there was no other sword on that day except the sword of Ali. There were warriors on the day of Uhud, but Ali's courage was so great that it's as if there was no warrior on that day other than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, in addition to those three who were defending the Prophet. Because Rasulullah is now surrounded by the brigade of Khalid ibn al-Walid. So you have 200 against three and four if you include the Prophet. So Ali and Abu Dujana and Sahal ibn Hunayf, they're literally three men trying to fight off 200 men who are trying to kill the Prophet. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon these individuals, especially Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now, there's an interesting, uh, there's a beautiful report in Tafsir al-Qummi. Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi, he reports that there was a woman who was also there defending the Prophet. And her name was Nusayba bint Ka'ab al-Maziniyya. She was also there when the Prophet was in danger and he was surrounded this Nusayba was one of the, the, uh, the women who pledged allegiance to the Prophet at the second Aqaba pledge. So she was one of the two or three women uh, who pledged to the Prophet in the second Aqaba pledge. And she used to always join uh, the Prophet's military campaigns as a nurse to the wounded Muslims. So she had a very important role in these uh, military expeditions. So she was at Uhud, and she was at Uhud with her son. And in the middle of the chaos and commotion, her son wanted to run away. Because you can only imagine, you know, literally people are getting butchered in front of your eyes. There's chaos. And he's a young man, you know, at the end of the day, people, people want to live. 
So her son wanted to run away. He wanted to flee. So she said to him that, do you want to run away from Allah and his messenger? So she rebukes him for even thinking about abandoning Rasulullah. He ends up staying. Her son decides to stay and he defends the Prophet until he's killed. Now, typically, if a mother sees her son getting killed in battle, most mothers would have an emotional breakdown. But this woman, Nusayba, she literally picks up the sword of her son who had just been killed. And she uses the sword to defend the Prophet, to fight off, defend off the enemies of the Prophet. And she actually kills one of the men, but she sustains a number of wounds. She survives, but uh, she, uh, she's badly wounded. So in addition to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Dujan al-Ansari, Sahel ibn Hunayf, we can also include the name of Nusayb ibn Ka'ab al-Mazniya as one of the noble women who, uh, who was willing to give her life to defend Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, in the Battle of Uhud, you know, one of the most tragic things about the Battle of Uhud is that the Prophet was actually badly injured in that battle. There were two individuals who were able to wound the Prophet during the battle. They were able to strike him. There was a man, a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Qami'ah, Al-Harithi. This man, according to the historical accounts that we have, he struck the Prophet with a rock. And he smashed the rock in the, into the face of the Prophet. And he broke the Prophet's front teeth. And he busted his lip and the Prophet was bleeding uh, profusely. And when he did that, he hit the Prophet so hard that he shouted out, I killed Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. And this is also what led many others to abandon the Prophet. They fled. Another man by the name of Mughira ibn al-As, this man was one of the mushrikeen. He didn't have enough money to buy weapons, you know, because weapons were expensive. Not everybody could afford a javelin or an uh, you know, arrow, bow and arrows or swords. So this man, he he takes three stones with the intention of killing the Prophet. And he manages to hit the, the hand of the Prophet. And he knocks uh, the sword of the Prophet from his hand. And with the other rock, he smashes it against the forehead of the Prophet. And the Prophet, uh, blood begins spilling uh, from his forehead. And, and he also, so Mughira also, cries out that, you know, Muhammad is dead. And this is where you see, unfortunately, many companions uh, retreated. Many of them, there were some who retreated when Khalid ibn al-Walid attacked and others ran away. They gave up after they heard that call that Muhammad has been killed. And this is where we see there's an interesting uh, narration where this was long after the death of the Prophet. Someone asks Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib that, you know, why, why did you stay in the battle of Uhud after that call was made that Muhammad has been killed? Why did you stay while others fled? So Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, go and ask the ones who ran away. And then after they answer you, come back to me and I'll, I'll tell you why I didn't flee. So the narrator, he goes and he essentially interviews some of those companions who were still alive, who fled in the battle of Uhud. And he asked them, you know, why did you retreat? Why did you run away? in the battle of Uhud. And they said that because we thought the Prophet 
was killed. And we thought to ourselves, you know, what's the point of fighting if Muhammad has been killed? So we ran away. So the, the narrator returns to Amir al-Mu'mineen and he says, O oh, Ali, I spoke to those companions who fled and this is what they said. They said to me that we ran away because someone called out, Muhammad has been killed and we thought, what's the point of fighting? What's the point of continuing to fight if Muhammad has been killed? That's why they ran away. So oh, Ali, why did you stay? This is where Amir al muminin he says, the reason why I stayed is because in my mind, what is the point of living anymore if Muhammad has been killed? And this is where you see a stark difference between Ali ibn Abi Talib and others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes many of the companions in Surah Ali Imran, verse 144, where he says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِمَّا تَأُقُتِلْ إِنْقَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيَجْزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ Allah says, Muhammad is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die, rather if he is killed, would you turn back on your heels? Meaning, would you go back to kufr and disbelief? Would you go back to your old ways? And he who turns back on his heels will never harm Allah at all, but Allah will reward the grateful. So the Prophet is badly wounded. Uh, some reports mention that he was unconscious for a few moments, he regains consciousness, he climbs to higher ground because uh, it seems that he fell into one of those, uh, those ditches. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, because of the heavy fighting, uh, he removes a few rings of chain mail that were embedded in his cheeks. And when he removes them, some blood trickles down his face. And when the Prophet sees blood dripping down his face, he makes the following remark. He says, how can a people who cut the face of their prophet and break and, and broke his teeth, a prophet who calls them to worship Allah, how can such people thrive or be successful? And then the narration says that the Rasulullah paused for a moment and he said, Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. My Lord, forgive my people, for they have no knowledge. And this is an amazing dua, brothers and sisters. Because number one, the Prophet still calls these people, the mushrikeen, he still calls them my people. Yes, they're wicked, they're corrupt, but I still feel a sense of responsibility to them. I'm concerned about them. Forgive my people, for they have no knowledge. And this is a dua that the Prophet is making 13 years, not 13, 16 years, almost 16 years, 15, 16 years after the Bi'atha. So even though the Prophet has been preaching to them for at least 12 years, the Prophet says that they still don't know enough. They're still ignorant. And so you see the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ, even in the heat of battle, even as blood is pouring from his face, he still makes dua that, oh Allah, forgive them, forgive my people, because they don't, they don't know. Now you can imagine, after a couple of individuals who attacked the Prophet, after they claimed that they killed the Prophet, there was a lot of confusion about whether the Prophet was dead or alive. And the Prophet managed to, to climb up the mountain to find a secure place. Uh, and this is where you see that even Abu Sufyan was, was confused about whether or not the Prophet was still alive or not. He didn't know. Some of his men are saying that Muhammad has been killed. Others are saying that, no, we think he's still alive. So we have the following narration that says, 
Abu Sufyan was on one of the hills, he was on the Mount Uhud, and it seems that the Muslims and the Mushrikeen, at least some of them were, were hiding in the mountains. Abu Sufyan, he climbs Mount Uhud, and basically he declares victory. He says, U'lu Hubal, you know, exalted is Hubal, which is one of the, the main idols of, of Mecca. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلَهِ And it seems that Abu Sufyan was not able to see the Prophet. The Prophet was, was hiding. And when the Prophet hears Abu Sufyan praising Hubal, Hubal he says to Amir al-Mu'mineen, O Ali, say, قُلْ لَهُ Say to Abu Sufyan, Allahu a'la wa ajal. Say to him that God is greater and more exalted. فَقَالَ يَا عَلِي إِنَّهُ قَدْ أَنْعَمَ عَلَيْنَا Abu Sufyan says to Ali that, that the God, God has shown us favor. He has favored us over you. We defeated you. فَقَالَ عَلِيٌ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen he responds by saying بَلِ اللَّهُ أَنْعَمَ عَلَيْنَا The Imam says no, Allah has, Allah has bestowed favor upon us. ثم قال أبو سفيان يا علي أسألك باللات والعزة هل قتل محمد؟ أبو سفيان he asks علي أو oh, علي I ask you in the name of اللات والعزة his two gods these two idols he asks Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is Muhammad dead was Muhammad killed؟ فقال له أمير المؤمنين لَعَنَكَ اللَّهُ وَلَعَنَ اللَّهُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّى معك. The Imam says, May Allah curse Allat wal-Uzza and may He curse you, O Abu Sufyan. Wallah ma qutila Muhammad. I swear by God that Muhammad was not killed. وَهُوَ يَسْمَعُ كَلَامِكَ And he can hear you now. He's with me. فَقَالَ أَنْتَ أَصْدَقْ لَعَنَ اللَّهُ ابن قمي أزعم أنه قتل محمدا. أبو سفيان says you're right. I trust you, O Ali, more than I trust uh, those men who claimed to kill the Prophet. So you see that there was confusion even up until the end of the battle. Even the likes of Abu Sufyan was not sure uh, whether or not the Prophet was uh, was dead or alive. So after the battle of, of Uhud, the Quraysh, they bury their dead. Uh, the casualties on the side of Quraysh were quite uh, minimal. About 20 to 25 of them were killed. And while Quraysh is burying, while the pagans are burying their dead, Hind and a few other Meccans they're walking on the bottle, the battlefield and they're mutilating the bodies of the martyrs. When we speak about the battle of Uhud, we think that it was only the battle, it was only the body of Hamza that was mutilated. But the reality is all of the bodies, all of the martyrs of Uhud had their bodies mutilated with one exception. When Abu Amr, when that Christian monk, when Abu Amr al-Rahib, and of course they called him al-Fasiq, when he locates the body of his son, Hanbala, he asked the pagans, he asked that his body be spared from mutilation. So Hanbala was the only one who was not mutilated, per the request of his father, who was one of the leaders of the pagan army. Now, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam is summoned by the Prophet and the Prophet says to Ali that I want you to, to check and see if Quraysh are preparing to invade Medina or are they returning back to Mecca? Because the Prophet wanted to know that is, is, are, are the pagans now emboldened by their victory whereby they're going to they're gonna advance and invade Medina or are they simply going to return to Mecca. And the Prophet says to Ali that if you see them mounting their camels, then they are uh, preparing to go back. 
But if they mount their horses, then you know this is going to be a very dangerous situation because that means that they're going to enter uh, Medina and we have to catch up with them because our city does not have enough people to defend against an invasion. So the Prophet sends Ali on a reconnaissance mission and Ali ibn Abi Talib reports back to the Prophet that indeed they are preparing to return to Mecca and they're not going to invade Medina. When the Prophet descends to the battlefield, so he was you know, in the mountains uh, and then he comes down and of course he sees the, the bodies of the shuhada and the bodies are martyred. And he's angered by the sight of the mutilated bodies. And some of the Muslims, especially after seeing how gruesome the mutilation was, some of them were suggesting that, you know, for every uh, mutilated body, we should avenge by mutilating X amount of bodies from the, the mushrikeen. Or we should retaliate ten times, tenfold. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet and he reminds the Muslims that, that you should not retaliate in that way. In Surah Al-Nahl verse 126, Allah says, And if you want to punish an enemy, O believers, punish with an equivalent of that which you were harmed. But if you are patient, it is better for those who are patient. Now, of course, the Prophet shortly after uh, introduces the, the ruling that it is forbidden for Muslims to, um, to mutilate <clears throat> the bodies of even uh, the pagans. But again, the lesson here is that you have to be just and fair even when you want to retaliate. If you want to retaliate, it should be equivalent to the harm that you suffered, not more uh, than that. And of course, patience is, uh, is more virtuous. So they found all of the Muslim dead mutilated except for the body of, of Hanzala as we mentioned. The Prophet ﷺ, he gathers all of the, the bodies of the shuhada and he performs Salatul Mayyit, he performs the funeral prayer. Now for those of you who don't know, we have special ahkam, special rulings relating to those who are killed in the battlefield who are martyred in the battlefield. So a couple of exceptions when it comes to how we prepare for their funerals is that they are not given ghusl al they're not given that ritual uh, bath, the three washes that we typically give to a deceased. They're not given any ghusl and they're not shrouded. They're not, we don't do ghusl or takfin. They are buried in their clothes with their blood as is. So the Prophet recites uh, Salatul Mayyit. And as many of you know, Salatul Mayyit is basically, it's comprised of five takbirat followed with uh, certain adhkar, certain uh, invocations and, uh, and uh, you know, words of, of praise. The Prophet ﷺ, he offers a very special funeral prayer for Hamza. So typically, Salatul Mayyid is comprised of five takbirat. Five takbirat, no more than that. But with Hamza, Rasulullah recites 70 takbiras. And this speaks to the great status, the lofty status of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. And you know, up up until the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein, he was known as Sayyid al-Shuhada, the master of martyrs. Now, when the Prophet وآله, uh, returns to Medina, and it's not clear whether Fatima al Zahra uh, goes to Uhud or if she sees him on his return from Uhud, but in any case. When Lady Fatima sees her father's face and he sees how badly wounded uh, he is, she says, 
she raises her hands in dua and says, May Allah's anger be upon those who bloodied the face of the Messenger of God. Now, there were a number of notable personalities who fell on the day of Uhud. Among them, of course, is Hamza, the most important and the greatest loss on the, on the, uh, on the day of Uhud was, was, of course, the martyrdom of Hamza. And then, of course, Hanzala ibn Abi Amr. And then Mus'ab ibn Umayr, the great companion of the Prophet, uh, was martyred in the Battle of Uhud. And this is the same Mus'ab who the Prophet sent to Yathrib to teach the people of Yathrib Qur'an. And this man is responsible for the conversion of many of the residents of Medina. This is the first man to lead Salatul Jama'ah in, in Medina. So losing Mus'ab ibn Umair was indeed a devastating loss. And it was such a devastating loss for the Prophet that when the Prophet was lowering Mus'ab ibn Umair into his grave, the Prophet recited verse 23 of Surah Al-Ahzab that reads, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا The fact that the Prophet recited this verse really highlights what a great personality Mus'ab ibn Umair was. The Prophet says, reciting the ayah of the Qur'an, among the believers are men who were true to what they promised Allah. They were true to the promise that they made to God. Among them is he who has fulfilled his vow, meaning that they fulfilled their promise, they fought valiantly and they died, they were martyred. And among them is he who awaits his chance. And they did not alter the terms of their commitment by any alteration. Now, after the battle of Uhud, and there were approximately 70, at least 70 Muslims were martyred in Uhud. <clears throat> and you can only imagine, when you lose 70 men, that means that now you have a community back in Medina where there are now many widows and orphans. And there are families who are having trouble coping with, these, uh, with the loss of their loved ones. And this is where you see some very important ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah being revealed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, beginning in verse 153 of Surah Al-Baqarah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ O you who believe, seek help through patience and prayer. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. So Allah now is consoling the, the Muslim families, giving them the spiritual tools to endure uh, these great losses. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the issue of martyrdom. He reminds those families who gave you know, sons and husbands or nephews or fathers, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Allah says, and do not say about those who are killed, especially the ones who were just killed in Uhud, don't say, that, don't say about those who are killed in the way of Allah that they are dead. Rather, they are alive, but you perceive not. You don't, you don't realize it. You don't perceive, but they are in the presence of their Lord. They're in a, a temporary paradise, a barzakhi paradise. So just because you can't see them and you can't interact with them, don't think that they are dead. In verse number 155, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ And Allah again reminds the Muslims that this shouldn't be a shock to your system. We will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and the loss of wealth and lives and fruits, but give good tidings to the patient. You know, 
Don't think that every battle is going to be like Badr where it's a decisive victory and life is good. No, this dunya is going to have its ups and downs. So, so these are very you know, potent reminders to the, uh, to the, the community in Medina. So then Allah describes, you know, who are the patient ones? Because yes, you will be tested in a, in a, uh, in a variety of ways. But Allah says, give glad tidings to the patient. Who are the patient? The patient ones are those who when an affliction strikes them, they say, indeed, we belong to Allah and indeed to Him we will return. So they recognize two realities. Number one is that they recognize that God is the absolute owner of everything. He owns everything, including myself. So no matter what I lose, it's not a loss. It's simply, it's not something that was taken away from me. Because me and my belongings and my possessions all belong to Allah. So when anything leaves and departs, it's essentially returning to its original owner. And the phrase, وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ is a reminder of the impermanence of this life. Ula'ika alayhim. People who are like this, those who have sabr, ula'ika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahmatun wa ula'ika humul muhtadun. Those, those who understand inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un and they live according to those truths, those are the ones upon whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy and it is those who are the rightly guided. Now the heavy losses at Uhud bring another unforeseen challenge to the community as we mentioned with so many with the deaths of so many husbands and fathers how would the muslim community ensure the welfare of its widows and orphans surah an-nisa hints at a solution Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 3 of surah an-nisa he mentions the idea of men marrying more than one woman. And this is one of the ways in which uh, the Qur'an suggests, on how, suggests how to deal with the growing number of widows and orphans. Inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak in a little bit more detail about some of the, the after effects and the ramifications uh, that followed the Battle of Uhud. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in once again. And I look forward to having you join me uh, in our subsequent uh, episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you for the lecture. So when... Uh, Imam Ali was uh, when you gave the story about Imam Ali uh, saying that he would life is not worth living without the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, uh, I guess there's two questions related to that. Yeah. One, didn't Imam Ali know that the Prophet Muhammad, that the Prophet was still alive because he was next to him in the whole during the whole battle? And if he didn't, then uh, having the sentiment of like, isn't the sentiment that life is not worth living if the Prophet is killed uh, contradict with his responsibility of the liar? So that's a very good question. Now, I, I think that what Imam Amir al Mu'minin means is that protecting the Prophet is of such great importance that if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan is for Ali to be killed and uh, to continue to advance his message, then the Imam alayhi salam is willing to do that. Of course, we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi revealed and disclosed information to Amir al-Mu'mineen regarding some future events, but we don't know when this happened. I mean, when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is fighting in these battles, uh, we don't know if we don't know exactly when, when the Imam alayhi salam is fighting in these battles 
We don't know how much Ilm al Ghayb the Prophet disclosed to him. So when the when the Imam alayhi salam is fighting, we don't know if he's fighting knowing for certain that he will survive. Perhaps the Prophet did not share with him uh, you know, some of the things that will happen into the future yet, because the Imam alayhi salam used to have regular encounters and meetings with the Prophet, and, and at each of these meetings, he would share more and more information with uh, with the Imam. So that's number one. Number two, yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib can see that the Prophet is alive. But hypothetically, if the Prophet was, was to be killed, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen wouldn't just say that, okay, let me just protect my own life. He believes in the Prophet and he believes in the mission. He believes in the message of Islam to the extent that he values it more than he values his own life. That's essentially what the Imam alayhi salam uh, is saying. Thank you. And uh, when Abu Sufyan realized the Prophet was still alive after making his announcement, why didn't he pursue the Prophet at that point in time? Because now the it was more difficult because now the Prophet is is he's up in the mountains. He's not you know in the, in the battlefield, and uh, so the he he basically escaped. Uh, danger and now the muslims were by that time they were able to uh to regroup so the battle the battle was over and uh it seems that abu sufyan did not want to risk reigniting uh the battle because at the end of the day ali ibn abi talib is still there the prophet still has strength so uh the prophet basically was out of harm's way at that point and it, it, it would just wasn't strategic for, uh, for Abu Sufyan to continue. Interesting. And, and then why is it that, it, wasn't it the case that the standards uh, were established for how the spoils of war should get distributed after the battle? Uh, it's kind of surprising that the archers felt like they would miss out. You know, the, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the, the laws, regarding spoils a lot of a lot of these laws are revealed gradually so maybe they felt that because they did not fight or they did not shoot an arrow they thought that maybe they would not uh, be given a portion but indeed as we'll find that even those who tried to gather more at the end of the day the prophet divided uh, the uh, the shares he was going to divide the share. So they ended up, you know, losing out on dunya and they also, you know, almost lost their akhira with that, with that decision. But the laws regarding the, the division of spoils was revealed uh, gradually. And it seems that, uh, you know, maybe ma many of them were just not familiar. Because again, you, th this is not the same. There are, there are new Muslims now. There are, it's not the same group that fought in, uh, in Badr. So perhaps... You know, it's possible that some of them just didn't know what the uh, the procedure or the policy was when it comes to uh, dividing the spoils. And, and could you just talk a little bit about how Imam Ali, the Prophet Muhammad, just basically four, three or four people managed to yeah. hold off the entire army that was trying to attack the Prophet Muhammad? No, we don't. We don't have details about how, like specifically what they did, but it seems. I mean, I I think you can reasonably uh, imagine, predict that they probably formed a, a circle around the Prophet, and especially if they were exposed on all sides. Uh, and they just, uh, they, they basically created some sort of chain around the Prophet. And, uh, and of course, the Prophet himself was also, you know, fighting them off. But uh, it seems that they, they were very close to the Prophet's body and they created some sort of chain around the prophet to uh, to protect him from uh, from being struck. But even then, I mean, uh, they the prophet was still attacked, so uh, they were not they were not able to completely protect him. But they protected him from being killed. Uh, so uh, yeah, it seems that the prophet was uh, was in some sort of ditch, and. When you're when you're lower, of course you're very vulnerable, and it, 
it's it's possible that Ali ibn Abi Talib and, and the others they uh, they were there either they were above the the ditch and kind of protecting anyone from uh, from entering and attacking the Prophet, but we don't know the details. And you know, one one of the most difficult things about the Sira is that when it comes to the battles, the historical accounts give us snapshots, and it's it's very challenging to to reconstruct it chronologically or to reconstruct it in a way that uh, that gives those details. A lot of it is left to our imagination, unfortunately.